Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce our dinner speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Terry Carr. Uh, Terry is a Lehigh really graduate and, and actually uh, joined the faculty in 2004. He's a former fighter pilot and astronaut. He was one of the crew members of NASA's 11th Space Shuttle mission and actually logged 168 hours in space. He's got lots of awards, I'm going to just list a few of them here. Uh, New Jersey Distinguished Service Medal, Pride of Pennsylvania Medal, NASA Space Flight Medal, U.S. Air Force Commendation Medal. Uh, he's also an inductee in the Aviation Hall of Fame. Now, I was thinking about this, and I wanted to put Terry's accomplishments in perspective. So I'd like you all to consider this. Uh, in the history of the world, there have been approximately 107 billion people, give or take, who have lived in the world. Right, I got that from Wikipedia. So I know it's right. uh, now, of these, only 536 people have ever been into space. So, that is one in 200 million. Those are the odds there, which is about the same as Powerball. <laughs> so, that makes me think I should get Terry to buy my tickets. But without further ado, I'm very pleased to have Terry Hart here to, to talk to us. Well, thank you so much, Alan. And uh, so nice to join all of you here tonight to be part of this celebration of 125 years. Uh, particularly nice to see Al Pence and his uh, wife Muriel here tonight. Al was one of my professors back in the 1960s. He uh, gave me enough uh, understanding of materials just to be dangerous when I got to NASA, I think. And uh, I hope I did, his, uh, did justice to the education that he and the rest of my faculty uh, gave me here uh, in my uh, years at the uh, So, um, I'm, uh, I'm fond of telling my students in mechanical engineering uh, when they take my courses uh, uh, that you know we mechanical engineers uh, in the course of four years you know, learn how to design things. So we learn how to design airplanes, you know, we just learn, how to learn how to design uh, jet engines and so forth. Uh, but I make sure they understand the point that, that we know how to design them better, but we're always limited uh, by the materials that we have available to us to use. So I say, during your career, you keep very close to those guys over in Whitaker, wherever you go in your career. Stay close to the materials people, because they're going to give you the enabling technologies uh, that are going to allow you to do your job better in the future. So what I tried to do tonight, I tried to take some of my aerospace slides that I use on uh, some of my course material at Lehigh, and sort of weave into that uh, a feeling for how materials have affected uh, in particular, aerospace engineering during the last 100 plus uh, years here. And um, and so we call this enabling the moon, since uh, that literally is true. Uh, we would never have gotten there without all the, the good work of the people uh, uh, that supported NASA with better and better materials uh, during those years and since. Um, so this is a, 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 a painting by an artist named Robert McCall, uh, who does uh, kind of space age uh, scapes. Uh, for uh, the Smithsonian and other people at the commission to do it. And this one he entitled uh, 100 Years of Powered Flight. And, uh, and it is, in fact, uh, uh, from the Wright brothers uh, through the space station, as you can see there. So let's walk through some of that 100 years and uh, talk about how materials maybe affected us. Uh, we all got started with the Wright brothers. Uh, Orville at the controls there back in 1903 there. So a little over 100 years ago. Uh, you know, they, I told my students they didn't have the, 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 uh, the privilege of having an education like our students get here at Lehigh. Uh, but they were pretty good engineers, even without that formal education. Uh, they were actually bicycle mechanics from Ohio, as many of you know. But they really knew how to put things together. They made wind tunnels that uh, uh, able uh, to check the camera on the wings and do all that kind of stuff. And they got us airborne and got the whole industry started uh, back there in 1903. Um, then, uh, you know, it was very slow progress, I think, for the first 20 or even 30 years. Uh, this is a World War uh, One fighter that uh, the British have, that many of you know, Snoopy and the Red Baron, you know, the software camel. And the structure was uh, mostly made out of wood. Um, every faculty member is, is lost without a laser pointer. Uh, so uh, the software camel was a, a major success, and many of them are still flying today, been restored and all. 
Uh, and it was made mostly out of wood, as I say. And it's kind of interesting. I called my friend Bill Brower at Boeing, who uh, runs the wind tunnels for the entire corporation now. But uh, uh, at the time um, uh, I first met him, he was running this wind tunnel down near Philadelphia Airport, uh, Boeing's low speed wind tunnel. And it was interesting because this is a 10 megawatt uh, electric engine here, uh, electric motor that powers this wind tunnel. Um, and uh, uh, supplies air to the test section at about 250 knots. Uh, so they do a lot of testing there in the test section. But these blades were wearing out, and they had them made about 30 years ago out of uh, a spruce wood from uh, uh, Oregon. It was interesting because uh, this particular facility at Boeing that does helicopters and the B-22 Osprey uh, is probably a world, world leading expert in composite materials as they are applied to helicopter blades uh, particularly. Uh, and they thought for sure that they would replace these spruce uh, blades with, with composite materials. And lo and behold, they couldn't make the composites work as well as the uh, Sitka spruce from Oregon. So they went back to Oregon and, and, and cut down a few more trees to make this uh, laminated structure of spruce wood. So it was the original composite material, and we, uh, we should think back you know, sometimes that even though this is very old technology, sometimes it still is the best answer uh, to some of our problems. And, uh, so Boeing's been very happy to see that um, uh, they could change those blades with new, uh, new wood. Uh, well, back in the, um, in the 20s and into the 30s, uh, Charles Lindbergh was one of our pioneers, that uh, you all recall his name. And uh, the technology was moving out of the wood into metals, and uh, we're still kind of with uh, uh, radial engines here, but uh, with a lot of um, uh, guts. Um, uh, Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic Ocean, took him over a day to fly across in this airplane. Uh, and landed in Paris, and he really launched uh, the uh, aircraft industry in terms of the uh, airline industry in terms of uh, international services and so forth. Uh, he was quite a pioneer in his time. Uh, but as we approached uh, uh, the 30s and into uh, World War II, the technology really hadn't moved that much. This is the PT-17 Stearman, uh, Boeing's first airplane. Uh, fabric, and again, a lot of wood, you know, some metal structures, a radial engine still. Uh, so it was a wonderful trainer, and a lot of these are still flying today, but still the, the technology was moving rather, rather slowly. Uh, in the World War II, though, of course, the, the, the pace of technology picked up dramatically. Uh, at the end of the war, the P-51 was the state of the art of our machines at that point. Um, and it, there's a leak eye connection here, too, actually. The engine here is a, um, uh, a Allison uh, V-12 engine, about 2,500 horsepower. An amazing uh, engine that was produced. It was uh, licensed from the British. It was actually the British uh, uh, Merlin engine that was on the Spitfire. And uh, they licensed that to uh, Packard, and that was James Packard of our Packard lab thing uh, that took that engine and produced it during World War II uh, to support the, um, the Army Air Corps and the P 51. Uh, state of the art at that time, uh, this airplane would be about 450 miles an hour. And uh, at that speed, the propellers would start to go supersonic to actually generate shock waves. Uh, so it really couldn't go much faster. Uh, but that was where we were in 1945 or so when uh, World War II was over. <clears throat> After the war, then all that momentum continued. All the, the push to go wings and very thin wings and a needle nose and all those kind of things. I said, well, congratulations, because you knew more when you were five years old than the aeronautical engineers knew in 1947. So we didn't really know about sonic shockwaves and what it took to go through transonic drag and all this kind of stuff that we teach in our aerodynamics courses today. But we learned uh, the basic lesson here is if, if you put enough power behind something, this is a rocket engine, uh, liquid methane and oxygen, yeah. liquid oxygen uh, that you could, go, you could go supersonic. And they got this up to 1.3 uh, Mach uh, miraculously. Um, well, quite a bit of change. That, again, that momentum just continued through the 19, uh, uh, in the 1940s into the 1950s. So within 10 years of that time, we were now flying in this airplane, uh, designed by Kelly Johnson of the Skunk Works uh, in uh, Burbank, California. Uh, the F-104, this is a NASA version of it that we used for astronaut training and high altitude uh, uh, test flying. Uh, a sustained Mach 2 uh, with this airplane. Uh, again, very thin wings and needle nose and a fairly good engine uh, with an afterburner and all. Uh, the technology was just moving so fast uh, during this time. That same engine that was developed by Pratt & Whitney, the J-57, with an afterburner, uh, became the basis for the airline industry and that Boeing took that engine, uh, put it on the uh, Boeing 707 there, 
and now we were able to fly for the first time then in 1958 or so uh, anywhere in the world in one day. So that was a bit of a change for uh, uh, the way we view the world uh, and that you could get um, uh, in this airplane you know, from um, the, the USA Asia, for example, in, in one day. Uh, big change. So the technology was pushing for faster and higher. And about that time, the space age began. Uh, the Russians uh, scared all of us. I was a young lad growing up in Pittsburgh. Uh, I remember very well uh, uh, when uh, Sputnik was launched uh, in October of 57, uh, uh, that the nation was uh, in a state of uh, 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 terror almost. That the Russians were about to take over outer space and control all of us. We'd become their minions. And uh, the, the, the scare was there. Uh, served a very good purpose, of course, because it, it gave a kick to our country to get going with science and technology and, and focus on these things. We really weren't that all, all that far behind. We launched Explore just a couple months later, uh, and the race was on. Uh, we hired our first uh, crew of astronauts, and NASA was, fun, uh, was formed uh, under President Eisenhower at the time. Uh, this was the original seven. Uh, John Glenn, the third from the left there, is still with us. Uh, uh, Senator Glenn uh, was retired there in Ohio and uh, living a healthy life still. Uh, and this is the F-106. I flew that airplane a lot myself in the Air Force, uh, but at that time it was an administrative airplane for the astronauts at NASA. But the race was on to get a man into space. We weren't doing too well. It was all live on TV. I remember myself watching uh, some of these failures. Um, this was an Atlas rocket. It had a little bit of a control problem right at launch and went sideways instead of up. <laughs> uh, hit the, hit the uh, structure, um, which ruptured the tank and it blew up. So it seemed like about 50-50 pretty much, about half were working and half weren't working. So we were uh, uh, a little bit panicked that the, the, the Russians, the Soviets were moving uh, much faster than we were uh, toward getting the first man in space. We finally got one rocket kind of fairly reliable, the Army Redstone, really a little pipsqueak rocket, it's only about uh, 50 feet tall. In fact, it didn't have enough power to generate the velocity needed to stay in the orbit, you know, roughly 17,500 miles an hour. So it was a suborbital uh, rocket, but nonetheless, we're going to put one astronaut in the Mercury capsule on top of that and get ready to launch our first uh, astronaut into space. There was a bit of a struggle in NASA at that time. In fact, when I was there, that struggle still continued in some flavor. Uh, between the doctors and the astronaut office. Okay, so the doctors were a fairly conservative uh, bunch, uh, and they were worried about weightlessness. They thought that you know, humans could probably breathe okay in weightlessness, but they didn't think you could eat or swallow anything after you'd probably die. <laughs> there were always horror stories about uh, going up. So we were uh, having a struggle uh, at NASA at that time, uh, so the first astronaut in space was Ham, and, uh, as a test plane. Redstone in 1961, so in January. He was four years old at the time, and he was a pretty smart little chimp. He actually could listen to the radio and throw fake switches that would tell him to do things to make sure that he was still uh, uh, with us during the 20 minute of uh, weightlessness before he could re enter. Um, and in fact, when I was there for training in, in the 70s and 80s at NASA, the trainers would often remind us that Han was easier to train than we were. That he could listen much better and behave much better than we did. So, uh, but anyways, uh, so Ham uh, had a successful flight. Uh, actually, when he came down, uh, the capsule hit the water with the parachute on and everything, and the abruptness of the shock actually caused the uh, pressurization system to shut down. It was about 90 degrees that day uh, out there on the ocean in the Gulf Stream. And uh, the Navy frogmen went out there and opened up the, the hatch and went to get Ham out. It was about 140 degrees inside, and Ham was like furious. It was so hot, and he bit the Navy frogmen on Ham. <laughs> so, but he, he survived. He actually lived to be uh, 23 years old. He had quite a nice life. NASA took very good care of him. So, uh, so we got ready to launch our first astronaut in space, and he was a Russian. <laughs> Yuri Gagarin the first human to fly in space. And, uh, and he not only went into space, he orbited the Earth. Uh, he, he made three orbits around the Earth. And even today, if you go around the former Soviet Union uh, nations, there's giant statues of Gagarin uh, around, uh, around there. He uh, became a hero of the Soviet Union. Had a kind of a tragic life. Uh, and was killed before we landed on the moon. He was uh, out with a big fighter one day, and, and he hit the ground and was killed. It was kind of sad that the Russians would never let him fly in space again, uh, since he was such a hero. And, uh, uh, so he was upset about that, but it uh, was killed, unfortunately. Well, we weren't 
uh, too far behind, like about a, less than a month later, we launched Al Shepard on that redstone. But again, it was a suborbital flight. So uh, we really weren't uh, quite where the Russians were in terms of rocket uh, technology at that point. In fact, it, it, we thought we were way behind. It turned out in retrospect, we were just a little bit behind. The, the, the case was that their German rocket scientists were a little bit ahead of our German rocket scientists <laughs> at the time. So both, both, uh, both communities were really, we had Dr. Uh, Warner von Braun, of course, and then they had, they got about two thirds of the scientists that were on Pina Mundi uh, at the end of World War II, and the other third uh, managed to escape to the West. Uh, so the competition was really uh, between those two groups. Um, but now the, 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 um, the call is on though to do more, so. Well, we finally got that, that, that uh, Atlas rocket working. Uh, it's an Air Force ICBM that NASA repurposed them for uh, launching John Glenn. So this rocket had enough uh, power to get into orbit, and John Glenn was the first uh, American to orbit the Earth then, uh, almost a year after uh, uh, Al Shepard's uh, suborbital flight. There's John. That Liberty Bell, I think was the name of his uh, castle, that's in the Smithsonian down there in Washington. Well, on the uh, aircraft side, amazing things were happening. Uh, this is the X-15, <clears throat> which uh, the uh, Air Force and NASA uh, test pilots were taking uh, to try to explore hypersonic flight, which is basically Mach 5 and above. Uh, and with again, with uh, liquid methane and liquid oxygen and engine back here, uh, this airplane would get out to those kind of speeds. Uh, made almost entirely out of ink and uh, because of the, at Mach 5, you, uh, even titanium uh, softens too much. So, uh, so very heavy and, and uh, at a very high landing speed, of course, but it would come in a little bit. And I think there were uh, 199 flights of the uh, X-15 was one of the most successful test programs that really uh, uh, took us up to the edge of space. This airplane would go up above 50 nautical miles, which is the international limit of space, and um, uh, did so many times. So a very successful test program for, uh, um, and a lot of materials were compressed then uh, to the limits of the, most of the Inconel um, uh, kind of alloys that they were using at that point, very heavy. Um, Amazingly, uh, this airplane, <laughs> I still can't believe this. I told my students uh, to read the book. Uh, in fact, the uh, uh, Alden's here at Nairobi uh, was the head of uh, Lockheed Skunk Works uh, for some years. But the, the fellow was the head during the design of this airplane, uh, uh, which is depicted in the book called Skunk Works. Uh, it was Kelly Johnson again that did the F 104 earlier. But the SR 71 started flying in 1962, first for the, uh, it wasn't called the XR. So that's our, SR-71 then was called the A-12 for the um, uh, Oxcart for the CIA. So it was being uh, flown as a, a spy airplane, basically. And uh, made it almost entirely out of titanium. Whoops, wrong way. Uh, almost entirely out of titanium. Um, if you read Kelly Johnson, or uh, the, the book about Kelly Johnson and the engineering of this airplane, uh, the big breakthrough here in materials was learning how to weld uh, titanium. Because uh, this airplane at Mach 3.2 uh, required titanium. You can do aluminum up to about Mach 2 or so, then you need to switch to titanium. Mach 5, you need to switch to even out. Uh, so they had to make this kind of work with titanium. So there were a lot of uh, uh, issues there. The, the airplane would get so hot when it flew at that speed uh, that it would actually stretch, uh, uh, I read it stretch about five inches. Uh, they had to design the upper and lower wings which hold the fuel tanks. Uh, these are basically like shingles on the roof of your house. So as the airplane stretched, uh, the shingles would, would slide over top of each other. But they weren't quite fuel tight. So this is a gas, this is a JP-5, the gasoline, the, the kerosene that they used uh, for these engines uh, leaking out of the airplane. So it was, it was a maintenance nightmare. You know? It was an amazing airplane and, and still holds the speed record today. There were over 2,000 uh, missiles shot at this airplane. Uh, during its, all its flights over places where it wasn't supposed to be. And uh, those, uh, nothing ever hit it. They never lost one uh, in those uh, missions. Um, and, uh, and they finally went public with it in 1972. It was the Air Force, in fact, I was there at Andrews Air Force Base, uh, the Air Force's 25th uh, birthday. Uh, they went public with this airplane. And everyone's jaws dropped. And meanwhile, I've been flying for like 10 years. <laughs> so uh, the Skunk Works is just amazing. I hope all that some words about the Skunk Works uh, for me later, because uh, he ran it for a while. Uh, uh, but it was an amazing you know, engineering organization. It still is today. Uh, who knows what they're doing today? <laughs> yeah, why not? Um, but that was one of their, their highlights of their uh, engineering uh, efforts. And, uh, and a lot of good materials research again. Uh, to figure out how to use titanium uh, in these kind of um, applications. Well, on the commercial side, again, in Mach 2, the Concorde was built um, you know, with aluminum, you can do that. And 
it was a pretty successful airplane in terms of the technical operations for 25 years or so. Uh, but when you're flying a Mach 2 with afterburners, you're burning about almost four times as much fuel per mile. Uh, now, when this airplane was first designed, you could fill up the tank of your Volkswagen with a pocket, with changing the pocket. <laughs> Gas is about $19, or 19 cents a gallon. Uh, but by the time the airplane went out of service, uh, uh, jet fuel was probably about $4 a gallon. So even at $6,000 $6, a ticket, this airplane was uh, losing money. So financially, it wasn't a good operation. And Boeing actually had a design, an SS, uh, supersonic transport design, which they decided not to do uh, because of the economics. But the French and the British did it you know, as a national flag uh, technology demonstration. It was very successful. OK, back to the space program. Well, the most amazing thing happened not too long after John Glenn had a successful flight. Uh, President Kennedy, uh, Kennedy stood up in front of the whole world and said, we're going to go to the moon, and we're going to do it before the end of the 1960s and come back. Uh, so that, of course, was what NASA wanted to hear to uh, uh, focus the nation and all the NASA uh, uh, organizations on how we're going to do this. And you kind of have to think back to that time period. We didn't even have pocket calculators back then. I mean, there was, we had very crude technology uh, on the computational side, you know, let alone the propulsion and all the other systems that had to be required. To, uh, to get to the moon, but it, it really focused NASA and the nation on making this happen. And of course, Kennedy had been killed in 1963, and, and the nation still wanted to make this dream uh, of his, the challenge he put forth uh, come true. So the, the next step was the Gemini program then, with two astronauts as a little slightly bigger capsule, and the Air Force uh, uh, Titan rocket, another uh, ICBM that was repurposed uh, for this mission. And so they did all the things they needed to do uh, to, um, oh, sorry, here we go to get in, uh, to the moon, we had to do spacewalks. We had to learn how to live uh, in a spacesuit outside the vehicle. Uh, Ed White here did the first spacewalk. Again, the Russians beat us just by about a month or so. So we were pretty sure the Russians were trying to go to the moon, although they never admitted it. Uh, the intelligence agencies could see what they were. In fact, they built three really big rockets called the N-1. Uh, the N-1 was bigger than the Saturn V, and, and all three of them had failed during first stage. They had a propulsion problem. Uh, in 1968 when the third one failed, without any people on it, uh, the third one failed, they stopped their moon program. But prior to 1968, they were trying to get to the moon. Uh, so we, we did a spacewalk and rendezvous, uh, dockings, all the things we needed to do. Uh, and then we were ready. And we were ready to go uh, in a bigger rocket, of course, uh, three-stage Saturn V. So this was Dr. Werner von Braun's childhood dream to build this rocket, uh, which you got to do now. Uh, so the first two stages would take uh, the lunar lander and the uh, command module into Earth orbit, and then the third stage would depart and take us, uh, take the crew to, uh, to the moon. So when the Saturn V lifted off, and in fact you kind of see how things evolved a little bit here. The first Saturn V was so heavy that when they, it was a test flight, and they knew this of course, when they lit up the engines, it had less thrust than it weighed. So it kind of sat there in the launch pad for, for a couple seconds before it burned out enough fuel to start accelerating on the launch pad. Yeah, and then the subsequent ones they made were a little bit lighter. They learned you know, how to uh, improve the performance and, and up, up the performance of the engines at the same time. Uh, but the Saturn V, even the, the last few missions, uh, was still fairly heavy, so it would kind of linger around the launch pad a long time. And uh, I was never there for a launch, but the people that were said that you could feel the ground shaking uh, all around it. It was just so powerful, uh, such a powerful rocket. And they all worked. They never had a Saturn V. They only had one engine failure, but never a, a, a mission failure on Saturn V. Well, we lost a crew um, in um, January '67. Uh, I was just a student here at Lehigh. We lost a crew in a tragic fire on the launch pad. NASA had to rebuild the program, uh, redesign the command module, and get flying again. And probably the most courageous decision NASA ever made was uh, uh, right after the first successful Earth orbit mission, Apollo 7 they decided to go to the moon. Now the lunar lander wasn't ready, so Apollo 8 went to the moon without the lunar lander, but Al, uh, uh, Frank Warman uh, and his crew were circling the moon, and ironically, on uh, Christmas Eve in 1968. And, uh, and uh, this picture, uh, iconic picture from the 20th century of uh, the first Earth rise that we ever saw, uh, changed the way we think a lot. Uh, I think both politically and, and environmentally, we could see that we're all on this little blue marble and floating through space, and we better learn how to take care of it and take care of each other uh, as we go forward, because uh, this picture really did change uh, the way people think about, about our, our, our place in the universe. 
Uh, it was a very dramatic uh, mission, of course, and, and uh, probably the, the most uh, bold uh, decision that NASA ever made. Uh, it was to launch Apollo 8 uh, to the moon that, that December. Uh, and of course, there were, uh, there were multiple landings. We had six landings on the moon. This is my boss when I was at NASA, the head of the astronaut office, John Young. Uh, went to the moon twice, once on the, uh, as a command module pilot where he stayed in the lunar orbit. And then Apollo 16, he was the commander and went down to the uh, surface of the moon. And then there was Apollo uh, 17 was the last landing. But uh, again, just how engineering works and our ability to apply materials in more efficient ways. Uh, Apollo 10 actually was the, the first mission that descended down toward the moon. They knew the lunar lander was too heavy to land on the moon and get back up again. So they intentionally aborted at 50,000 feet, came back up to the, they were just testing all the systems and came back up again. So Apollo 11 was the first lunar lander that we built that was light enough to land on the moon. And the Armstrong landed with like 30 seconds of fuel left uh, and get back up again to the command module. Uh, so every time we built one of these, we learned a little bit more you know, about how to build them better uh, and uh, how to improve the propulsion systems and so forth. So by the time we got to uh, Apollo 15, 16, and 17, we were taking the lunar landers up uh, and driving around for many kilometers around the surface of the moon. So it was a highly successful program. I think all, all Americans are very uh, proud of, uh, of what we did in that uh, decade of the 60s. Uh, we had one, uh, actually we had three Saturn Vs left over, and um, uh, the others became um, museum pieces. But one of them, well, we took the upper, the Earth departure stage, the third stage, and turned it into the laboratory and, uh, and put that into Earth orbit. And three crews lived on Skylab for up to three months uh, at a time uh, back in the in 73. And it was a very successful program. They wanted to do material science uh, and weightlessness because a lot of people were scratching their heads trying to figure out, you know, what you could do uh, with uh, with weightlessness. Uh, they weren't quite ready. There wasn't quite enough power available on this thing with the small solar arrays. So they kind of limited their re research to Earth observations and solar uh, astronomy. Uh, they uh, but a very successful uh, program, uh, but just not quite ready yet for material science. And then the shuttle came, uh, started designing the shuttle in the early 70s, uh, and it was ready to go in 1981 uh, to be reusable. Um, so here are the challenges uh, from a materials point of view were the heat shield, uh, a silica material. Uh, it was really quite amazing because uh, the structure of the shuttle orbiter underneath uh, the heat shield uh, was just regular old 2024 T6 aluminum. It was just really uh, at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, it would start to soften, you would lose its strength. So it had to be protected uh, from the 3,000 degrees of reentry heat. And the silica material was just amazing, uh, and it would do it. It felt like styrofoam, very lightweight, uh, and very fragile, unfortunately. You could dent it uh, just with your fingernail. Uh, but they, they could heat that up with a, with a torch so it was glowing red hot. And if you were careful, you'd still pick it up by the corners because the heat conductivity was so uh, low in it. Uh, that, that it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't hurt your fingers. Uh, but at any rate, that worked uh, pretty well. It was very fragile and required a lot of maintenance between flights. Uh, the reinforced carbon carbon on the leading edge, uh, but the silicon material on the bottom was the, the key thing. And it took a lot of work to figure out how to bond that on uh, the aluminum so that it would stay uh, during reentry. And the other major area of material, so the area I worked in actually, John Young had asked me when, he, uh, when I first got out in NASA, he, I was walking down the hall one day, this way in the national office, and I see John, you know, my boss, coming the other way, and he starts talking to me, and uh, John's a, a Georgia cracker from Georgia Tech, really good engineer, but, but he, uh, he kind of uh, acts like he's maybe not, not, not as much with it as you would think, but he's a uh, really uh, smart engineer. He, he, he keeps on talking as I walk by, so I do a U-turn and follow John into the men's room. And so he sits down in the men's room when we're talking, uh, and uh, he says, uh, Hart, he says, you're, uh, you're an engineer, aren't you? You went to Lehigh, didn't you? I said, yes, sir, I did. <laughs> he said, well, you know anything about propulsion? I said, well, I, mean, I took a course from Al Stenning in propulsion. And I didn't say how, but I, said, I took a course with, uh, at Lehigh in propulsion. He said, well, I want you to make sure those engines don't kill me. This is before SDS-1. So I, I started to work with NASA uh, down at the uh, Bay St. Louis Test Facility, Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, watching the test and reporting back to John every Monday how the engines were doing. So it was amazing technology. Uh, the, this engine is still state of the art today, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Uh, the nozzle is mostly titanium, so there the issue was welding the titanium nozzle. The whole power had is Inconel. Uh, Inconel works you know, real well at down at cryogenic temperatures. Uh, but to make this engine work, took a lot of, a lot of effort from uh, Rocketdyne and the NASA people uh, during 
the time. And I was privileged to be representing the astronaut office and all that, uh, thanks to John's uh, assignment to me in the men's room. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, let me give you a little idea of what it's like. Uh, we were fortunate to be the first crew to fly the IMAX uh, camera in space. And uh, we did a little video that uh, Walter Cronkite narrated for us. And uh, here's what a launch looks like. I want you to watch as the engines light up, the torque on the stack will cause this point to move about three feet to the left. When it comes back, the solid rockets ignite and away we go. That's only one and a half million pounds of thrust there. You get about three million from the uh, each from the solid rockets. The first two minutes are really a lot of vibration. You see the shock waves are coming off the main engines. The first uh, two minutes, a lot of you feel like you're going on a railroad track at about 60 miles an hour, and a lot of bumping and shaking uh, for the first two minutes. The solid rockets, uh, like an organ pipe, they have a uh, resonance around 11 hertz, uh, which is high enough it doesn't couple with another structure, which you feel. It. Crew feels that like hurts uh, vibration from the solid rockets, uh, plus a lot of uh, shock waves and so forth at this point. Right, right here, this the vehicle supersonic, about 30,000 feet, and then uh, right after uh, throttle up, um, when we hit max dynamic pressure, max Q. Then after that, you're, you know, when the solid rockets come off, um, you know, two minutes and 15 seconds after uh, liftoff, you look up and it's black. I mean, you're almost out of the heart. Our atmosphere is that thin uh, that you're really out of the uh, atmosphere uh, at that point. Oops. Why am I not advancing here? Ah! <laughs> Bill Gates. Oh, wait, we got, we got a Microsoft guy here. Where, where did Malcolm go? One of our cable mates works for Microsoft. I'll have to give him a hard time. Sorry for that. Doesn't like coming in and out of videos, I guess. I need to tell Malcolm that I switched to Apple's. Quiet. He used to work for Apple. Did he work for Apple too? Okay, so that was the um, I'll show the launch. Uh, I'm happy to say the very first experiment that was done in the space shuttle program came from Lehigh. And it was two fellows that um, many people in this room probably remember. Uh, John Vanderhoff and, uh, and Mo, our former provost uh, and dean, uh, ran an experiment starting in the very second sh shuttle. Flew, I think, about four or five times. But the first time it flew was on SDS-2. And they were trying to build the, to uh, manufacture these little latex spheres that are used kind of as calibration uh, standards on electron microscopes. Uh, so they're, they're uh, even on Earth, they're, they tend to be very much the same size, but they tend to be a little rougher uh, in weightlessness. They ended up being very pure, as you can see here. So it's a very successful experiment. Um, most of us at NASA at that time thought this was just the beginning of a whole series of things that we're going to manufacture in space. Pharmaceuticals, uh, semiconductor things. It hasn't quite worked out. We haven't found a real home run commercially. This was a success commercially, but we didn't need a whole lot of these to uh, satisfy the, the demand for uh, 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 microscope you know, technology. But, uh, but other things are coming in there. We're doing a lot more stuff on the space station now. So I think we'll see an evolution in the future of more and more manufacturing in space of new materials uh, that can't be made in, in 1G, but we can manufacture in weightlessness. So we'll see more of that. In fact, one satellite that, that we had on our mission was this long duration exposure facility. Uh, and I deployed this with the mechanical arm, as you can see here. Um, this is right over the Gulf of Mexico. In fact, here, right there is Cape Canaveral. Right there. There's uh, Lake Okeechobee. And uh, uh, Apalachicola. Right there. So, uh, this satellite weighed about 32,000 pounds. And it's about as big as a school bus. This is 30 feet and 14 foot in diameter. There were uh, uh, 85 trays on there. And the trays, 150 scientists from all around the world that contributed the experiments uh, to these trays. Which were gathering micrometeorites and cosmic rays, and because things actually weather in space in low Earth orbit, so we wanted to understand how they weathered, so we could design the space station and so forth in the future. So it was pretty successful. In fact, here's a video of deploying that or part of the deployment sequence. Just give you an idea of what it's like 
this is real time, so we're in the Pacific Ocean here. There's the satellite and the tail of the shuttle orbiter, of course. Uh, you can see how thin our atmosphere is. You, hardly, you can hardly see the atmosphere from space. It's so thin. See the U.S. here. That's Mexico. But things go by about the same rate as if you were in an airplane. So after you're in space for a while, you stop thinking about being in space. You think you're in an airplane and kind of watching things go by. And instead of you know, Harrisburg and then Pittsburgh, it's India. Here comes China. <laughs> so the uh, LDF stayed up for six years, and then uh, Bonnie Dunbar, one of my uh, classmates at NASA, uh, captured it the arm and brought it back to Earth. And things were actually, spoils and all, were actually disintegrating in, uh, to some extent uh, due to the monatomic oxygen that gets kicked up out of the atmosphere by the sun, causing a lot of corrosion. So that, uh, but they, we learned a lot from the satellite about materials and uh, that helped uh, NASA design the space station. So we have a limited amount of maintenance required on the space station today. Uh, the more exciting part of our mission, we were the first one to do a rendezvous and a repair and this satellite was launched before the shuttle came online back in 1980 by the Goddard Space Flight Center. It's a solar observatory, solar maximum. Uh, and very shortly after it was launched on the Delta, uh, it started spinning out of control. So we had planned for two years rehearsing that uh, George Nelson, one of my crewmates, was going to fly over and dock to it, uh, stop the spinning so I could grab it with the arm. It didn't work. <laughs> it a lot, it, it, you can almost be guaranteed that when you do something for the first time and weightless, this is not going to work. And sure enough, the docking adapter malfunctioned, so the satellite was kind of tumbling a little bit. I got it got it back under control, and then I grabbed it with the arm and, and we repaired it um, uh, over a two-day period there um, and put it back in space. So let me show you a little video of that. Uh, so the, the, high, the highlight of my mother's life was when she saw this, and Walter Cronkite uh, called me TJ. <laughs> That's Walter Cronkite, for those who don't remember that voice. He was amazing. He was a real friend of NASA. So this is the satellite was spinning, uh, but not so fast that I couldn't grab it with the arm. And, uh, a little celebration and mission control. Yeah, Bob Kirk and my commander. So we had a little celebration. We got that out of work. Solar Max, now safe in the cargo bay, is rotated into position for repair. It's wonderful working in weightlessness. It takes about two or three days to get the hang of it, and then you just, you know, it's like a new freedom. It's so hard to describe. Six years after that, I finally ran and let it go. As Challenger and her crew pull away, they leave behind vivid proof that we can work in space. So that was a big mission for NASA because it demonstrated what we could do with the shuttle uh, repairing things. And uh, we did four actual uh, service missions, they called them, uh, to the Hubble. Uh, they repaired some things, but uh, over the life of Hubble, uh, they upgraded the electronics and the um, uh, pointing mechanisms, the control moment gyros. All that stuff was upgraded to newer technology. And uh, Hubble today can point uh, 10 times more accurately than it could when it was first launched because we were able to upgrade it with a shuttle uh, over the years. 
and um, it's been very successful. The pictures from Hubble, you know, been breathtaking. This is a little uh, what, what the astronomers call a star nursery, where you know, cosmic dust is gathered to form these very new stars in this nebula, and uh, lots of amazing pictures. Uh, there's another telescope coming. Uh, it's uh, being built down at Goddard uh, right now, but I took my students down last spring to look at it. Uh, it's called the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, James Webb was the head of NASA during the Apollo uh, program. Uh, amazing. I think, I think he was the only non-technical head of NASA, and most people would historically say he was also the best administrator of NASA. Uh, amazing guy. Uh, but at any rate, uh, they're naming the telescope after him. It's going out to uh, L2, which is uh, way out uh, past the moon, uh, and it's going to follow that point, or, uh, follow the Earth around at that point, uh, one and a half uh, million kilometers you know, from the Earth. Uh, the reason they're putting it out there so far uh, is they get it away from the Earth. Uh, if you look back, you would see the Earth in the middle of the sun, and the sun would be all around it. Uh, so they have to block it from the sun. The problem with Hubble is every it's a low Earth orbit, so it spends about 50 minutes in the sunlight and then 40 minutes in the Earth's shadow uh, as it goes around every orbit. Uh, every time it comes out of the Earth's shadow and in the sunlight, it heats up, and that thermal distortion actually causes uh, error in pointing of uh, Hubble uh, that they can't correct. It's, it's just an inherent uh, structural uh, working that, that happens. So they want to put the satellite way out there uh, where they can see it all the time from the Earth, of course. Uh, the Earth is uh, spinning every 24 hours, of course, but we've got three deep space network here in Madrid and Australia, so one of the three can always see it. Uh, but more importantly, it's got a constant uh, thermal environment, and they're going to keep it benign. Uh, there's two acres of, uh, I guess it's a mylar material. Uh, it's a sunscreen, a two-acre sunscreen that's going to block the sunlight from hitting the main dish, and it's in the infrared range. It's going to be back, be able to see uh, infrared um, photons that were generated at the Big Bang. Now, Hubble can see back about, I think, about 12 or 13 billion years. It's imaged uh, galaxies that existed uh, 12 or 13 billion years ago. You know, we think the universe is about 15 billion years since the Big Bang. Uh, this observatory will be able to see an infrared band all the way back to the Big Bang, uh, background radiation, basically, the infrared. So it's going to be amazing. Uh, uh, and I hope it works because we can't fix it. <laughs> it's up there, it's too far away. We can't, uh, even the next shuttles are not going to get up that far. So they've got to make it work right, and they're focused on that right now. So it's going to launch, I think, about 2018. Uh, it should be uh, launched. It's launching on a French uh, rocket out of uh, French Guiana. That's the Europeans' contribution to the program. So I hope the rocket works too because only built one. It's about an $8, $8 billion project. So that would be amazing. Though. Okay, so we. Um, this is the way we do a rendezvous. Here's the space station. We'll talk about the space station next, back in uh, September uh, 2006. Uh, STS-115, the Atlantis uh, launch. This is the space station came by, which is how we do rendezvous. And it takes about three days to catch up at lower orbit to the space station, and we do a docking. Uh, here, the space station uh, back in 98 was about half built. Uh, here, this is about half, halfway constructed. Uh, we always have a Russian Soyuz capsule on one end. It's kind of a lifeboat. This picture was taken from the space shuttle, of course, right over Cape Canaveral. That's Cape Canaveral right there. Uh, Lake Okeechobee and the Bahamas. Now, almost any astronaut will tell you the prettiest place in the world uh, is the Bahamas. Uh, the Bahama Islands and the Gulf Stream coming up here. You can see the pretty colors here. But when you see it in, in, uh, in the flesh, it's just an unbelievable uh, image of how pretty this part of the world is. Uh, but that was the space station. Now this is a lot of solar power here. Uh, here it is in, in completion, uh, fully operational here. Uh, the space station generates about a quarter a megawatt of power. So now they have all they need to do to run all the furnaces they need to do for any kind of laboratory experiments. There's a lot of materials processing you know, going on on the space station. Uh, they have ample power uh, to do that. Um, it was ironic, we, all the pictures we had of the space station, like the previous one, were all taken from the shuttle. So we never had a picture of the shuttle docked to the space station. So the very last mission, uh, this, uh, the Endeavour, uh, the second last mission of the program, uh, docked. And then the Russians took the uh, Soyuz off back here and flew around just for the purpose of taking this picture. So we have a picture of the space shuttle and the dock to the space station. Uh, the scale is a little, this is a football field here, uh, basically. The, that little hatch right there, that little circle where the crew goes in, uh, that's six, six feet in diameter. Give you an idea of the scale of things here. 
It's a big, uh, and this is uh, it's funded through 2020, but I think it's going to be up a long time. And we usually have six or eight astronauts and cosmonauts at any time uh, on board the uh, space station. Well, the last shuttle uh, flew in July of uh, uh, 2011. There, Mary Jane and I were right on here, <laughs> watching below the clouds, and uh, that ended the space shuttle program. So uh, I'll tell you in a minute what we're doing uh, at NASA going forward here. But there is another part of NASA, of course, uh, uh, where they do unmanned missions, and uh, it's good to celebrate their efforts too. And they do a lot of good research and materials, mostly out of Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, in uh, Pasadena, California. Uh, some missions are run out of uh, Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins. Uh, this particular one, Curiosity. Uh, so I started hearing about this back in 2010, and uh, you know. I'm, picking up descriptions that they're going to go into Mars atmosphere, they're going to do some heat shield uh, deceleration, they're going to eject the heat shield, put a parachute out. In Mars' atmosphere, is only about 1% of the Earth, so you don't get a lot of drag from the parachute. Uh, and then they're going to come down on the parachute, and then they're going to light up some engines, and then they're going to hover over the surface of Mars and lower the rover down uh, until it touches the surface, and they're going to cut the cable, and they're going to fly off over and crash. And I'm saying, that's never going to work. <laughs> I hope they're building two. And uh, they're already building one, and it worked. Uh, it's just amazing. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory guys are part of NASA, uh, Caltech and NASA. Uh, but they're just amazing. And they designed this thing, and it worked. Um, uh, there's a picture from the um, Curiosity of the Heat Shield after it's separated on reentry. Here's a picture. Uh, they orchestrated all this to have the Mars orbiter right over top of the reentry of Curiosity as it came in. And they took a picture of it on his parachute there. And then here was the heat shield coming off. So just amazing how they orchestrated all that. And then when Mars uh, orbiter came by the next time, uh, you could see the rocket blast from Curiosity where it landed. After it dropped it off there, the sky crane flew over here and crashed. There was the, the reentry shield and the parachute. Oh, there's the heat shield. And there's the parachute in the back shot. So, uh, so nine months to get there, a bunch of mid-course corrections. This was their Three Sigma error ellipse on the surface of Mars. They figured it'd be uh, hopefully somewhere in that area right there. They missed by uh, about one and a half kilometers. <laughs> this is pretty amazing. Uh, so they landed in a fairly flat place on that old uh, lake bed, and, um, and they're heading toward Mount Sharp, because Mount Sharp is really interesting. They're, they're getting pretty close there. It's been two years now, so they're up over two years now. They're getting close. This is what it looked like when they first landed. So this was an old lake that when there was a lot of water on Mars many uh, uh, millennia ago. And Mars has got a little, a little smaller than the Earth, so it doesn't have as much gravity, so that water eventually boiled off into space. But here's Mark, Mount Sharp. They want to get there because they think there's sedimentary rocks there. And if you're going to find a fossil from anything that lived maybe on Mars a long time ago, it'd be in the sedimentary rocks. They're trying to get there. Um, more recently, uh, they launched New Horizons. This was an applied physics lab uh, down at Johns Hopkins uh, mission to Pluto, and they're very surprised uh, about the features on Pluto, so there's a lot to learn there, too. Um, this is a commercial business I was in before I retired, and we built these, uh, at at t we designed these satellites at Lockheed Martin, build them, and launch them into space. Uh, a lot of composite materials and honeycomb, a lot of good exotic materials on here. Uh, semiconductors on the solar arrays, galley marks and I now. So a lot of good materials to make these things possible. They generate about 15 kilowatts of power. And almost all your uh, direct TV, your dish network, and all your satellite, your uh, main networks uh, use these kind of satellites to distribute their video. On the commercial side, yeah, Boeing uh, has got a home run here, I think. Oh, uh, it's an amazing airplane. I can't wait to get my first flight on it. But the, uh, the 787 is almost 50% uh, uh, by weight composite. Materials. Um, the biggest breakthrough is probably the way they're building it. Uh, Boeing actually builds very few parts. They put it all together. <clears throat> the wings are made by Mitsubishi in Japan. A lot of it's made in Italy. All around the world, the parts come together to Everett, uh, Washington, and now also down to South Carolina uh, to assemble these. So I think it's going to be a home run. Very quiet engines, a bypass ratio of 10 to 1, uh, huge windows. And the first time, uh, Humidity is being added to the air inside the cabin, so you won't get dried out so much on long flights. So I think it's going to be a home run. We'll see. A lot of, lot of good materials technology in that. Uh, on the military side, uh, radar absorbing materials for these stealth uh, fifth generation fighters now, the Raptor, amazing airplane, thrust vectored engines that can fly right down to zero airspeed in the pilot and still control it. Uh, amazing technology. 
But more and more, we're moving toward uh, UAVs, as you know, uh, drones. Uh, this is the Predator drone that's been a little controversial. Uh, here's a Hellfire missile that they've been using to, to shoot bad guys in the Middle East there. Uh, basically, a snowmobile engine in the back. It's fairly uh, inexpensive by aerospace standards. The whole airframe probably cost a million dollars. Uh, and uh, they can fly these for 30 some hours, maybe 36 hours uh, from a hangar in Nevada. They can fly them uh, all around the world. So uh, this is the future of a lot of um, aviation, both for military and commercial applications. They say the three Ds, if it's dirty, dull, or dangerous, you want to put a person in the center of the drone. Okay, back to the space program. NASA's doing two things. Uh, to replace the shuttle, uh, access to low Earth orbit, they've gone to a service contract, basically, with two companies. Elon Musk uh, has started up SpaceX uh, on the West Coast, and they have the Falcon 9. Uh, and Orbital Sciences down in Dulles, uh, Virginia, uh, has the uh, uh, Antares and the Cigna capsule. So both of them are uh, under contract by NASA to deliver uh, goods. Uh, uh, the Antares launches from uh, 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 Virginia on the coast there, Wallace Island. Uh, on the Delmarva Peninsula, uh, so they put an on-ramp here to the space station, and uh, I think they take up about two tons. Uh, the Falcon 9, though, um, uh, what's amazing most here, this company's actually designed their own propulsion system. They do their own engines. Elon Musk is an amazing uh, entrepreneur. Uh, but the Dragon capsule can carry up about 10 tons, and it comes up on autopilot to the space station and kind of parks itself close enough that the crew can use the arm of the space station to grapple it and then bring it, uh, dock it to the uh, docking port there. And then uh, offload it. So 10 tons of cargo can come up and they can send back to Earth uh, five tons. Uh, or uh, Musk wants to send up astronauts. So uh, the replacement to the shuttle for access to the space station will probably be this vehicle first. So the seven astronauts will fit in there. Limited control, they got a window and some uh, backup emergency control but most of they're just along for the ride, and, uh, and they'll uh, go up to the space station this way. Or we could do a mix of cargo with fewer astronauts, uh, which would be the more likely configuration. Comes back on parachutes like Apollo, three big parachutes with a heat shield, and uh, lands in the ocean. There was the first one that came back. Uh, most of that scorching from reentry is cosmetic, uh, can be refurbished. I don't think he's refurbished any of them yet, but he plans on reusing these touching up the heat shield a little bit and cleaning them up and using them again. Uh, so it's going to be very successful. A lower cost way of getting uh, access to space uh, is the idea here. Okay, so NASA's other side is looking at deep space and sending people back uh, to deep space. Still a little question where. Uh, but they're building the rocket, they're building the capsule. So Boeing's building this rocket. It's a Saturn V class rocket, from about 360 feet tall, just like the Saturn V. Using space shuttle hardware, they just stretch the solid rockets. Uh, these are kerosene liquid oxygen engines. The second uh, and third stage are shuttle engines, basically liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Uh, so it's going to be uh, quite a rocket. It'll uh, probably not slip out in 2018, but the first test flight will be uh, in that vintage right, right now. The uh, Boeing is getting it ready to go. Uh, that'll be this one, the Block 1 uh, crew module, uh, 70 tons to lower Earth orbit, 70 metric tons with solid rockets, then they'll upgrade that to liquid booster rockets on the side, get up to 105 tons, then upgrade the engines on both the main stack and the boosters to get up to 130 tons to orbit. So some of these are manned and some of them are, are uh, just big cargo vehicles. So the idea is um, you could send like a mothership to Mars with this, uh, a fairly big uh, spacecraft to Mars, park it in orbit around Mars, and then send the crew uh, on this, on a, uh, subsequent trajectory uh, on another vehicle uh, a few months later, for example. So there are lots of combinations here as they build this capability up for going and taking people um, uh, uh, and almost anywhere you want, want to go uh, in our solar system here. So the capsule is uh, like Apollo, except it's a little bit bigger, so it's four people can fit in there uh, with a heat shield for reentry and all. Lockheed Martin is building that up in Colorado. Here's what it looks like. We've got some idea of the scale. Uh, Escape tower for the launch pad if there's a failure. Okay, where are we going? Well, it's a little bit controversial. Um, all right, so here's the sun. So there's Mercury, Venus, Earth right there. So we're going around once a year. So here's Mars. It takes Mars almost two years to go around. So we want to go to an asteroid. The, the moon is interesting, but, but the scientists say we've got enough moon rocks. We'd rather get some asteroids. 
Because asteroids are really the primordial material of the, universe, of the solar system, and we can learn a lot more scientifically from that, they tell us. Um, well, you know, it's nine months to get from the Earth to Mars, uh, and you gotta wait for things line up to get back. Uh, well, we're gonna go see the new movie on Saturday Night Army Suite, uh, The Martian. <laughs> she read the book, she put it that book. Two nights she read the book. So, so it's like nine months to get there, and as, as um, who was that? Matt Damon, as Matt Damon found out, he was stuck, because you have to wait till the Earth and the Mars line, line back up again before you get back. Uh, but at any rate, um, so, so we can't do that right now, let alone that. So we're not going to get out to the asteroid belt. But it turns out that there are a bunch of asteroids that are pretty close to the Earth. So again, here's uh, Mercury, Venus. So the green orbit is Earth, so we're going around once a year. There's two big asteroids, uh, one's in this orange orbit and one's in the blue, that we can get up to those and back in about five months. We can do either one. One of them's uh, available in 2019, so I think we missed another one on that one. Um, but we could do this one in 2025. So that's one thing we could do. The other thing is to go up there and grab a smaller asteroid that's in a similar orbit and bring it back to us with a remote spacecraft. In fact, bring it back to lunar orbit and park it by the moon so it's only three days away instead of two or three months away. So, so both those missions are being contemplated right now. I think they're leaning toward the rendezvous or the asteroid retrieval mission, where they bring the asteroid back and park it right between the Earth and the Moon, where the gravity balances between the two, about 36,000 kilometers from the Moon toward the Earth. Park it there, and then we could visit that you know, readily uh, with a, a two-day mission, basically, to the to rendezvous, and then take samples and bring them back to Earth. So I think that's part of what they're going to do, but we're still waiting. Uh, for that, and uh, of course, you know, Congress is really focused on this right now. So hopefully, Congress will do something good here in the next few years and uh, support this kind of a mission. We're, we can only hope. Um, but whatever we do, um, we've got the vehicles under construction now, both the Orion capsule that we just talked about and the rocket, the the, uh, the large uh, Saturn V class rocket. So with that combination, we, we could go back to the moon. That, that could be the decision. Well, I think we're leaning toward the asteroid. But this hardware we're building would allow us to go to Mars. So we could do a Mars mission. Uh, it's just a matter of focus. You know, we just have to, as a country, decide we're going to do this. And as a, hopefully as a world, we'll decide we'll do it as an international mission. And I think it'll be exciting. Uh, and I tell my students to try to imagine what the next 100 years will be when you look back at what we did the last 100 years. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, I, how long do we have some time for a couple questions? Or? Okay, and I, any thoughts you have that you might want to talk about how, how Lehigh particularly has been involved in material science and, and all the things that have happened the last hundred years? I'd love to hear those stories. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, based upon my limited knowledge, assuming a carbon nanotube elevator could be suspended yeah. in outer space. Yeah, space elevator, yeah. Yeah. It'd be great. Yeah. I think they're working on it. I think the, the nano, uh, the carbon, uh, what do they call carbon balls or the the, the nanofibers, buckyballs. Yeah. So the the technology is going to the point where the the strength to weight ratio may allow what's referred to as a space elevator. So picture this: if you go up about um, thirty six thousand kilometers, about twenty four thousand miles above the Earth. You're in an orbit that turn that goes around once every 24 hours, so it's stationary orbit. That's where the communication satellites are. So you can put a very large satellite up there and lower a ladder down to the Earth that was strong enough to support itself, and then you can climb up that ladder and, um, and send cargo up to geosynchronous orbit. I think it is. I mean, the the, the people that know these things and uh, say that we're getting to the point where the where the strength of weight. Uh, ratios of the materials uh, involved through, because of these carbon te new te carbon technologies are getting to the point where it may be possible. Oh yeah, I think well, in Rutgers, I know the lab at Rutgers, the Extreme Environment Lab, is doing some of that. Uh, Heim uh, Benarara is the PI there that I, that I know. Uh, and there are others, I'm sure, too, that are looking at it uh, as a possibility. I, well, I don't know, you know, I, um, uh, but, I, but the people that, that do study that, unless they're just trying to get money from the NSF, <laughs> they're, they're, they say it's possible, you know. But, yeah, <laughs> I think we'll see it. You know, maybe not in our lifetimes, but I think we'll see it. So. We have time for one more question. Yes, yeah, yes ma'am. I noticed that the Earth is 
when you were floating in space, or the astronauts were floating in space, on their white spacesuits, they had a red line around their thigh. What's, mm -hmm. that, what's that for? That's so we can tell who's who. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they all look alike. They're all white suits. Yeah. So the, the uh, MS, um, see, I was MS-1. MS-2 wears the, Mission Specialist 2 wears the, uh, the first spacewalker wears the red stripe. That was Pinky in our mission that tried to dock to the satellite. And then uh, MS-3 was Jim Van Hoften on my mission that doesn't have the strike. So. Oh, yeah. okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> you want one more question from Tony? Yes, yeah, I, yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, thank Lehigh University. Uh, the past, uh, like, 19 years, minus this one year, uh, I served as a principal of the Los Angeles That's great, Tony. Yeah. 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 Yeah.